in five, four, three, two, one. We are now live. Uh, good evening, dear seniors and colleagues. Uh, it's it's indeed a privilege and honor to present you um, our Young Surgeons Forum next episode on complex primary total hip arthroplasty. And for the mentor speaker for this session, we cordially invite uh, Dr. Krishna Kiran sir. Uh, he happens to be an eminent, uh, young, talented, extremely entrepreneurial uh, surgeon in uh, South India. He practices in Medicover Hospitals in Hyderabad. And he's uh, one of the finest surgeons uh, uh, who is also using robotic technology uh, quite often. And he's one of the most influential peoples in art plasty that we have come across these days. So we, we'd like to hear from his experience, um, some tips and tricks about uh, protrusio and dysplastic hips in this session of Complex Primary. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen and I'll be talking first about... Uh, Principles of total hip arthroplasty in hip dysplasia, and then uh, hopefully about uh, protrusio. And if time permits, we will see some videos so that the young surgeons are benefited. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So, uh, the first thing we must consider when we're uh, considering developmental dysplasia of hip is whether it's a uh, primary dysplasia where, you know, there is a developmental abnormality like a congenital dysplastic hip where there is abnormality in the acetabulum or in the proximal femur or both. That is the definition of dysplasia. Or is it a, a developmental anomaly which is secondary to sequelae of childhood pathology like post-septic arthritis, post birthies or post-trauma in children? So we will not dwell on the childhood pathology because that is a big topic in itself. So we will restrict our present uh, presentation currently to the developmental dysplastic hips. So this is uh, important to understand. The uh, acetabulum on the dysplastic hip is abnormal and the proximal femur is abnormal or both can be abnormal. So this is a, a picture we must understand. So typically the acetabulum is shallow like this, like a plate. The superior inferior dimension of the acetabulum is larger than the anterior posterior dimension. So on an AP view, it will appear that the acetabulum is very large. But actually, the real acetabulum is somewhere there and very, very small. So this you must understand. And this is what we call as hypoplastic acetabulum. So the real acetabulum is hypoplastic. There is excessive antiversion of the acetabulum. That is a native antiversion. So if you go with the transverse acetabular ligament, the antiversion will be more. The medial and posterior walls are typically more thick and there is deficiency in the anterior superior part of the acetabulum. So these are the five basic points about dysplastia in acetabulum. Again, on the femoral side, the version is more, that is, there is excessive antiversion. There is coxa velga, that is, the neck length may be more, but the offset will be smaller. And the femoral canal is typically very, very narrow. So we are looking at situations where we will have to use special type of implants to address the excessive antiversion, to restore the coxa valga, and also to address the narrow femoral canal. So most of the cases of dysplasia, it is not possible to go with standard implants. And this is where the young surgeons make a mistake. So they will go with a standard implant and get stuck on the table because the anatomy of the femur in these particular cases is not amenable to standard implant usage. So this is another point we must keep in mind. Now, we have abnormal soft tissues. We all know about the intra-articular and extra-articular barriers of reduction in a congenital dis dislocated hip. All of us know that there is a hypertrophic limbus, there is a hypertrophic pulvinar, and you have the capsule, which is, you know, hypertrophied and thickened, and then you have the psoas, which forms an hourglass contracture of the capsule. In addition, all the peri-articular uh, soft tissues like the sartorius, rectus femoris and the pelvic femoral muscles are all contracted. So these make the reduction of this hip uh, a little bit challenging, especially in the higher grades of dysplasia. Now, we all uh, have heard about the Ranavat classification, which is popularly referred as Crow classification. Uh, Dr. Ranavat was the one who proposed this uh, classification system. And it is simplified like this. So what we can look at is in grade one, less than 50% of the native head is subluxated. So around more than 50% of the 
femoral head is still articulating with the native acetabulum. So, how do we know the native acetabulum? The native acetabulum starts with the teardrop and it constitutes one fifth of the dimension of the pelvis from the superior iliac blade to the inferior ischium. So, you have two lines drawing the uh, inter iliac blade and inter ischial lines and then divide that into five quadrants and at least one fifth of that quadrant from the teardrop up is the native acetabulum. So, if your femoral head is at least 50% of the femoral head is articulating with the native acetabulum, then it is a grade 1 dysplasia. In a grade 2 dysplasia, there is more than 50% but less than 75% of the head subluxation. So, this is easier to understand for the younger colleagues. So, you have native acetabulum somewhere here, but you can see that less than 25-30% uh, of the head is in contact. So, that's the situation of a, a, a crow 2. In a crow 3 dysplasia, you have more proximal migration. In this particular situation, what happens is more than 75% but less than 100% of the head is subluxated. So, you still have some contact with the native acetabulum but majority of the femoral head is outside the native acetabulum. And in grade 4, this is a completely dislocated hip where no part of the femoral head is in any sort of contact with the native acetabulum. So, these are the crow 4. Uh, dysplasia uh, situations where there is a dislocated femoral head. So, these four patterns we must look at the x ray and be able to recognize what pattern is this one. And grade 1 and 2 are one category, grade 3 is a separate category, and grade 4 must be planned and executed in a separate category. Now, you also have the heart of classification where you have a low, intermediate and high varieties. So, this is nothing but a similar to the crow classification. The low is probably grade 1 and 2. The intermediate is grade 3 and the type C is a grade 4 type of dislocation. Now, how do you identify that this is a dysplastic hip? So, all of us uh, have read about this. We have to look at the AP and lateral views and we must calculate the superior lateral center edge angle. So, the if the lateral center edge of, uh, angle of Weibog is less than uh, 25 degrees, then it, there is some element of dysplasia or if there is a discrepancy between the two sides, if there is a normal side and an abnormal side and there is more than 10 degrees of reduction in the center edge angle, then you must consider this particular hip to be dysplastic. Again, you also have the anterior center edge angle, which indicates the excessive antiversion. So, again, if the anterior center edge angle is more, then again, those particular cases are dysplastic. So, this AP and lateral you must look at. And you must also identify that these sort of cases with grade 1 dysplasia have got a thick medial wall. You can see the distance from the uh, medial part of the femoral head to the teardrop on the uh, affected side. It is pretty thick. And there is a hypertrophy of the medial and posterior walls. And this is what determines the surgical strategy in these cases. You can see that the lesser trochanter discrepancy between the two sides is not that much. And therefore, you can expect to get away with a standard neck length and offset type of implant. However, if the combined antiversion of that native hip is more than 45 degrees, which you cannot correct with a standard implant, sometimes you might have to have implants which have got ability to be worked independent of the femoral anatomy. So, you have three basic implants which are possible to do that way. One is the SROM implant which is a modular implant. Two is a cone Wagner type of implant which can be adjusted craniocordially as well as circumferentially wherever you want based on the combined antiversion of the hip. And third of course is a cemented hip which we can all use at any point in time where you can have craniocordal as well as 360 degree versional adjustment. So, the strategy in grade 1 dysplasia after we identify is to medialize the acetabulum with or without a superior autograph. Most of the times, if you medialize it till the iliopectineal line, you will not require a, any a sort of coverage. And then you will use a standard femoral stem in most of these situations. Now, acetabular options in dysplasia are threefold. You can use a, a, an anatomic hip center with superior graft to reconstruct the deficiency because you have anterior superior deficiency. You can use a high medialized hip center. So, you should not use a high lateralized hip center. What is a high medialized hip center? You go around 1 or 1.5 one centimeter higher than the teardrop and you create a socket there because that is where the hip has been lying and loading. And this is typically applicable in grade 2 and grade 3 dysplasia. It is not applicable for a 
crow four dysplasia so please don't confuse grade 2 and 3 with grade 4 grade 4 is where the bone is maximally present only in the native acetabulum it's not present in the in the pseudo acetabulum but in grade 2 and 3 there is some amount of articulation which is happening in the ilium in the pseudo acetabulum and that is where the wolf's law loads and there is maximum amount of bone density so you don't want to bring it down and then try and reconstruct it with a superior graft you can always medialize the thing how do you know you have medialized enough you will medialize it till you see the pulvinar which is a fat pad at the level where the head is articulating so you don't try and go down onto the uh, transverse acetabular ligament area and identify the true acetabulum you just accept the slightly elevated partially elevated hip center and there are 10 year outcomes with uh, from ranavat group showing 100% survivorship when you use a medialized partially elevated hip center up to 1.5 cm so you should not put a 3 cm elevated hip center then the stresses will be different and then the risk of limb length discrepancy instability and the component failure will be higher then you also have the medial protrusion technique where you either create a controlled osteotomy of the medial wall you take multiple drill holes in the medial wall take an osteotome and create a controlled fracture of the medial wall and medialize the socket to obtain the superior lateral coverage this is little bit difficult to uh, you know do reproducibly and there is a potential that you may create a sort of a pelvic discontinuity whenever you try and attempt this sort of a procedure so we don't do this key point about acetabulum is this one you have to identify that the superior inferior dimension is larger than the anterior posterior dimension of the acetabulum so the reaming will happen in a direction from posterior inferior to anterior superior so this is called as pious reaming it goes from posterior inferior to anterior superior your reamer must be biased posteriorly because the maximum bone thickness is posteriorly you can put a finger on the back of the ischium and see how thick the medial wall is and till your thinning it down to 2 3 mm you can still bias the reamer posteriorly and then you keep medializing the socket either at the anatomic hip center or uh, uh, like this one where you know this is anatomic hip center so you identify the anatomic hip center ream the anatomic hip center and you can position the cup there and then you'll have some amount of anterior superior uncoverage up to 30% of anterior superior uncoverage is acceptable provided you get ap capture ap capture is between the remaining anterior superior and posterior inferior bone you position your socket and you rotate it there must be no rotation of that implant if it is rotating then that cup will fail the second thing which you require is a superior inferior stability at a plane perpendicular to this ap capture that is obtained by trying to toggle the implant from superior to inferior if you don't obtain it you can still get away by fixing that cup with screws but by and large for acetabulum getting that ap capture is the most critical step in any thr whether it's protrusio dysplasia or primary hip you must get ap capture as well as superior inferior toggle the alternative strategy is to use a partially elevated hip center like that you can uh, ream into that dysplastic area instead of trying to bring the cup down but you must adequately medialize this particular socket and the reaming goes from posterior inferior to anterior superior biasing the reamer more posteriorly and engaging into the medial bone as you go uh, deeper and deeper with the cup size and this is an example of the uh, uh, high hip centers the grade 1 to 2 dysplasia and i will quickly go through the uh, thing you can it's a standard posterior approach we have exposed the uh, thing you are doing the anterior capsulotomy there you can see that between the psoas and the femoral head neck you have the anterior capsule and you release that to uh, to expose the acetabulum well and once you make your measurements and in this particular case we are using a uh, an srom type of implant you make your neck cut and I'm, i i will not try and medialize the socket in this particular uh, example i will prepare the socket where it is loading and if if you see these x rays carefully there is some amount of sclerosis a tip about the a, the spike it must be in the direction of the anterior superior iliac spine and then it will not slip out and you can see here that that is the dysplastic segment i am not trying to expose the uh, uh, the transverse acetabular ligament or inferior part of the tail i am just reaming into the dysplastic segment without trying to bring it down so i am engaging from posterior inferior to anterior superior biasing my reamer posteriorly and 
reaming medially and the reaming stops when you see that white medial wall so you can see that the pulvinar tissue is now removed and there is a medial white plate which is the acetabular medial wall and then you can get complete coverage of the socket without having to put any superior sort of bone graft so yeah i'm checking for ap capture and superior inferior toggle so this particular thing you can use uh, without uh, screws and once you finish your uh, hip the x ray will look somewhat like this so where the hip center is elevated you see this is a tear drop and this hip center is about a centimeter or so above the tear drop but that is intentional and we have restored the leg length through using a, a larger diameter head or something like that and you can see that by using a modular implant i am able to get the native valgus and low offset type of situation so this is only possible using a, a modular type of implant or a cone wagner type of implant or a cemented stem which has got the appropriate neck shaft angle so now uh, this is the first case which we saw the uh, crow uh, crow one dysplasia where we have used standard implants and we are able to restore the uh, hip hip joint biomechanics the next step is the crow 2 dysplasia and here again the surgical strategy remains similar you can see that the center edge angle is uh, lower and you have a thick medial wall like we saw for the crow 1 but the hip is more proximally migrated and you can see this is anatomic hip center and there you may have to use a superior sort of a graft in this particular situation or you can use a high hip center whatever is the uh, one we are familiar with so this are the two options for these sort of cases and if you see here carefully you can see a lot of sclerotic bone there so that is where the hip has been loading and that is where the wolf flaw is acting so whatever you want or comfortable with you can do it and this is a intraoperative picture and that's a post operative picture where we did an anatomic hip center and we did not need to use any sort of superior graft now in grade 2 sometimes there is what is called as trochanteric overgrowth so there are variations in this grade 2 which you need to identify here the tip of the trochanter to the center of the head ratio is negative that means the center of the head is below the level of the tip of the trochanter these are the cases where you cannot use standard implants you must use a modular implant sink it low and try and restore this sort of an offset situation you cannot restore a native offset and you look at the distance between the ilium and the tip of the trochanter it is so less so there is supra trochanteric tightness in these cases where the abductor itself is tight so you must recognize this when you once you see the x ray and make appropriate plan you can have a partially elevated hip center like this one sink the stem low down and use a modular implant with a neck length which is got a 30 mm neck length option so that you are uh, not over lengthening that leg putting the sciatic nerve at risk now in grade 3 here the uh, strategy is like this we must use an anatomic or slightly higher hip center the cup size keeps reducing now you must have 42 38 40 cups available because sometimes the cup is only 38 mm in size and here you will only have a neutral liner with a plus 22 head if you are using a, a dipway type of implant pinnacle type of implant so you need to be extremely careful where you cut the neck and how you get the things back because most of us are not used to using a 22 mm head all the time and you must have definitely have modular stems which are starting right from 6 mm so this particular case we used a 40 mm cup the 22 mm head and a 6 mm stem with a 12 sleeve so these are bantam sizes which must be kept at hand when we are addressing these complex problems and this is a follow up at 5 years where everything is looking okay sometimes you can uh, accept a more higher hip center these are complex cases this particular case the native acetabulum we did a 3d printer and the native acetabulum was 36 at the native level and at a slightly higher level it was 38 we did not have a 36 socket so we did a elevated hip center so although this is slightly more elevated than what i would have liked we did not have much of a choice in this particular case however you must see that we have restored the leg length by uh, using a, a, a plus head and a 36 neck length in this particular case by using a high hip center it doesn't mean that we leave, leave the leg short you have to compensate it on the femur so that you restore the combined length of the composite length of that particular leg now a lot of people ask me when should we shorten what level and the term subtrochanteric shortening is used extremely loosely without having understanding of 
which cases will need shortening and which will not and i don't blame the surgeons because a lot of us also do not know exactly which cases to shorten and what level so we have come up with this classification so we must look at the distance between the ilium and the tip of the greater trochanters look at that here and look at that here so if there is a lesser trochanter is at or below the level of the tear drop then you usually will not require a subtrochanteric shortening that is a, a ballpark guide for all of you if the lesser trochanter is at or below the level of the tear drop you will not require subtrochanteric shortening and you must recognize what we call as subtrochanteric short uh, supratrochanteric shortening so this is an example of a supratrochanteric shortening where the acetabulum is shallow the abductor length is short and this trochanter is up so the strategy in these cases is to use a low neck length low offset stem sink it really low and accept that low offset situation because these patients will do pretty well with that or do a trochanteric osteotomy and sequential femoral shortening reduce the hip and rewire the trochanter so two choices for supra trochanteric shortening you can have situations like this where there is a sub trochanteric shortening here the relationship between the center of the femoral head and the tip of the trochanter is normal so there is a the center is at or above the level of the tip of the trochanter and the lesser trochanter is above the level of the tear drop so these are cases of normal neck shaft angle as compared to the native side and there is a proximal migration with the lesser trochanter above the level of the tear drop so these are cases of sub trochanteric shortening and then you have varieties where there is a combination of both trochanteric overgrowth and lesser trochanter above the level of the tear drop so these we refer to as combined shortening so you have cases where there is supra trochanteric shortening you have cases where there is sub trochanteric shortening and there is a combination of supra trochanteric and sub trochanteric shortening in certain uh, anatomic uh, condition and also all crow force are not the same so we've noticed several variations you have the normal neck shaft angle with upriding uh, uh, which is like this where the lesser trochanter here is probably at the level of the tear drop or below so you may not need to do a shortening here you have the valgus variety where the neck there is an overgrowth of the neck and the neck shaft angle is more than 170 or 160 degrees you have the combined shortening varieties which we already discussed about or you have the previously operated cases so all of them need to be dealt with independently so if you have a normal variation there is no discrepancy in the proximal diameter and distal diameter they are all uniform normally formed but if you look at a case like this where there is a uh, trochanteric overgrowth and upriding then there is a proximal distal mismatch in some of these cases the proximal is narrow and distal is wide and if you use modular implants sometimes you have get uh, trouble getting stability of the osteotomy when you use this so you must have a plate at hand when you have cases like this and whenever there are uh, uh, previously operated cases again the hips are stiffer and these cases constitute a separate challenge as to where we should do the osteotomy where we should do the correction and how you should do the uh, lengthening the basic principle remains the same this is the establer center of rotation that is the femoral center of rotation if you are having to lengthen the leg by more than 3 cm to get these two together that is the aim of thr to restore femoral and establer center of rotation at the same level then the sciatic nerve is at risk if you lengthen by more than 3 cm then you have to consider in your mind that probably this case will require a subtrochanteric shortening to offload the sciatic nerve so that's the primary purpose the secondary purpose is to take care of the pelvic femoral muscles all the pelvic femoral muscles are all shortened so if you shorten a segment of bone these muscles will relax and this will allow the hip to be uh, reduced back into the native acetabulum the only thing which will remain is abductor and this will still be tight but because we do a complete release of the proximal femur and do a shortening by uh, doing these things we will offload the pelvic femoral muscles and enable reduction of the hip joint so this case i told you the although it's a crow four your lesser trochanter is at or below the level of the tear drop so this case you would not need to do a shortening so you may be able to get away without doing a shortening one disclaimer here you must palpate the sciatic nerve when you are doing the surgery before you uh, uh, dislocate the hip or cut the neck and you palpate the sciatic nerve after the reduction if the sciatic nerve tension is increased significantly that is when you have to be careful you must probably consider doing a shortening in those situations because then the sciatic nerve will be at risk of palsy now the key steps for pro 4 are that you must look at the 
amount of upriding amount of shortening the hip center is always at the anatomic hip center and that is at the level of the teardrop what you do here however is you have to do a subprocentric shortening osteotomy for the reasons i told you to bring the hip back into the native acetabulum and there are several varieties of subprocentric shortening what we do is a, uh, a horizontal osteotomy and there are certain key principles for the subprocentric shortening osteotomy so what you must do first is you size the distal canal of the femur when we are doing it with srom you do the sleeve preparation corresponding to the distal diameter so suppose you have a 7 mm distal diameter you will prepare a 12 mm sleeve proximally you put in a trial sleeve and take another sleeve of a similar kind and put it on top of the bone and mark a point 1.5 to 2 cm distal to the sleeve location inside the bone and you mark the rotation of the bone rotation is not very very important but you can mark it just for completion sake then you do a complete circumferential femoral release except the abductors so you release the iliopsoas you release the anterior capsule you release everything um, from the proximal femur except the abductor to mobilize the proximal fragment once you do the uh, 300 degree release and do the osteotomy you can lift that proximal fragment up your acetabular exposure now becomes easier and you can prepare it easily the modular stem now you can place into the sleeve and it comes out of the osteotomized proximal fragment it doesn't go into the distal fragment but because you have done all this release it will be easily reduced into the hip joint what you now do is you pull on the leg you ask your assistant to pull on the leg and see the amount of overlap between the proximal and distal fragments and then you release the traction and see what is the overlap so you measure that suppose it is when pulling it is 2 cm and when you release it is 3.5 typically the shortening you will do is between 2 and 3.5 cm for that particular patient so you start with 2 cm you put it into the distal fragment you try and reduce not reducing you sequentially increase the amount of shortening you don't do all the shortening at one go then you are stuck because the hip becomes too lax the shortening is done as measured and once you reduce the hip you have to resize the distal canal because the distal canal which you have shortened is the isthmus and that is the narrowest part of the canal and typically what happens is the diameter of the uh, distal fragment increases so from 7 it becomes 8 or 9 so if you continue with your 7 you will not have stability across the osteotomy especially if you are using an srom so once you do the reduction you are sure that it's now reducing well you resize the distal canal use the proximal you wire your proximal fragment if it is very osteoporotic to prevent a collapse or fracture of that proximal fragment hold it with a bone holder and re prepare the sleeve and put the real sleeve now based on what is the distal diameter because using the correct distal diameter is the one which will give us rotational stability across the osteotomy so these are all the steps now the real implants are inserted and hips are hip is reduced so those are the steps which i told you and you can have a good 360 degree exposure of the acetabulum and that's how it will look at the end of the surgery similar examples with valgus neck where you will have to make a more proximal neck cut and the osteotomy sometimes will be at the level of the lesser trochanter because that is 2 cm below and that is a uh, post operative x ray left side you can see that the osteotomy is healing the right side was operated sometimes you have proximal distal mismatch where the proximal part is narrow and the distal part is very wide in these cases there are two options you can go with the standard configuration of srom and use a derotation plate as an additional stability for that or you can do a, a, a an expansion osteotomy of the proximal fragment so you can put in a larger diameter sleeve in a controlled manner by expanding into the proximal fragment and then wiring it so that is a little bit risky so we prefer to use a Uh, a unicortical uh, you know, plating to uh, give additional stability for the subprochanteric osteotomy and we will use the osteotomy fragment as a vascularized graft across the osteotomy site to give more stability sometimes previously operated cases you will have to osteotomy uh, improvise there you must osteotomy at the level of the angulation rather than osteotomy 2 cm distal to the sleeve and shorten the femur proximally rather than distally so that is a variation you have to make so you make the osteotomy there you mobilize the proximal fragment prepare the acetabulum position your sleeve and shorten 
a little bit from the proximal fragment, little bit from the distal fragment based on the amount of shortening you need. And uh, this is a video. Somebody asked me about the video of uh, subprocentric shortening. So I just tried and uh, put it. So um, I have already put in the, uh, this is the uh, neck shaft angle. I'm measuring the neck length and the offset. That is the guide for the uh, neck cut. This talk will be a little bit longer, but the next talk will be shorter because protrusio is not much to talk about. So uh, uh, we can compensate there. So the head is removed. And then you uh, position your sleeve and you make the osteotomy two centimeters distal to the sleeve. Okay. Once you do that, the establer exposure becomes easy, as you can see. It's almost nicely exposed. Then you make the preparation at the level of the anatomic socket and use the real establum. In this case, we are putting a, if I'm not wrong, a 44 socket. And it's always mandatory in bantam cups to use screw fixation, even though you get AP capture and superior infrared toggle. Because any cup which is less than 44, it's always better to use screw fixation. Complex situations, it's always better to be safer, you know, rather than do something and then something happens. Bone is also sometimes soft. So we always use screws for these cases. Now, this is the uh, sleep preparation. So the, in this case, this was a case where we did the osteotomy at the level of the angulation. So we did not prepare the sleeve beforehand. We prepared it later on by using a bone holder there. But normally you prepare the sleeve and mark a position two centimeter distal to that distal part of the sleeve. So this case was the angulation case where the, we did the osteotomy more distally. So I'm preparing the uh, sleeve there with the conical reamers. And you must be well versed with the use of uh, SROM implants in order to address these dysplasia cases. Because if you don't understand SROM or you don't know the sizes and how to do it, then it slightly more complex to deal with these osteotomy situations to get them stable and also proximal fixation. Because a lot of these patients are young and require more proximal fixation than distal fixation. So that's the uh, uh, spout prepare, uh, preparation where we prepare for the uh, triangular milling. So that is what we're doing. And the beauty is you can position the sleeve wherever there is bone in whatever version, and then you can adjust on the si uh, stem side. So now I'm uh, So I've shortened the thing. Um, uh, so you can see that uh, my assistant is now pulling on the leg. So I have reduced the proximal fragment. You can see that it's reducing nicely because of the 300 degree release. Once the hip is reduced, you ask your assistant to give traction to the remaining part of the leg and then see what is the amount of shortening. So that's the distal fragment I'm trying to hold. And my assistant will give traction. And we measure the amount of overlap. What is the amount of overlap? You measure. Suppose in this case, it was uh, uh, 5 centimeters or 4 centimeters. We removed the, uh, we marked the position 2 centimeter distal to the sleeve and shortened it from that particular part and little bit part from the remaining part of the distal fragment. So, but this is how you do it. You mark the position using an alternative sleeve there and then catch fit distally osteotomy can sleeve if required if required and then use the hip the real implant you will get complete rotation along with the limb rotation and uh, that's how the post-operative the osteotomy fixed with it this particular case we had a problem because we had undersized the stem and this is one of our uh, despite, you know, using a derotation plate and all that. And we had to revise it at an year where the sleeve was well ingrown. So we just removed the stem and put in a long uh, uh, stem. And this is a seven year follow up showing a complete integration of the osteotomy and the patient is doing well. The take home message for dysplasia must identify and classify dysplasia 
Acetabulum has got thick medial and posterior walls, which is deficient anterosuperiorly, of small size and with excessive antiversion. The femur is coxa valga, narrow with excessive antiversion. We must have a small socket size and modular implants to address these difficult problems. Pro 4 must be identified and dealt with separately. And high hip center is an option in grade 2 and 3 dysplasias, where about 1.5 centimeters above the native acetabulum hip center can be accepted in certain situations. Any questions I can address here? So fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for that. Uh, just one question from my end. Uh, when would you consider using a cemented stem versus an SROM or a, uh, a Pohm Wagner in these kind of cases? As in what That's, a, a decision uh, on? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I won't use a cemented stem ever in uh, dysplasia situations because uh, the narrow canals where we have to ream repeatedly, we will lose all the cancellous bone. And uh, there is a lot of evidence in literature which has suggested that if you ream a narrow canal and put a cemented stem, then the longevity is not that great. Uh, so for the cemented stem to function well, you will need to have good uh, cancellous bone. Having said that, the exeter group have got excellent results with subprochanteric shortening using the exeter stem, but I think it is limited to the exeter group. I have not been able to get the similar outcomes. Coming to Cone Wagner, Cone Wagner is a distally fixing uh, device. So I am not very inclined to use a distally fixing device in young patients. So I would rather use a proximally fixing device. So my implant of choice is SROM. The only uh, difference is whenever you have a proximal distal mismatch, sometimes Cone Wagner is an option where you know uh, you will still get distal fixation and you can you know uh, ignore the uh, osteotomy or the um, proximal part is still conical. So even though if it is narrow and distal is wider, you can use a cone magnet and get away instead of doing all sorts of um, expansion osteotomies or derotation plates, you can use a cone magnet in those situations. And in, uh, in, in, your, in your cases, in, in these years that you've been doing them, how many times have you had to put a graft superiorly after you've placed your cup? What kind of graft do you normally would prefer if you need to graft? So it's a good question again. So uh, I have never put any uh, graft superiorly. So my belief is that uh, the graft has no role. Uh, it will, you know, either resolve or it was not required in the first place. So if you are depending on the superior graft for giving stability, it is a false stability. So if you really had a situation, it has worked very well in astabular fractures in my hands, but I've never used it in dysplasia. So in dysplasia, usually if you medialize the socket enough, you will get away uh, without having to graft the superior astabular. And uh, if at all nowadays you need it, I think you should use a tantalum augment rather than a graft. Uh, uh, so uh, you can probably carry on with the next uh, presentation. Yeah. Sure. And we can have a discussion. Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So again, uh, dealing with protrusion is much more simpler than uh, uh, dysplasia because dysplasia has multiple grades which we have to you know discuss. But protrusion is uh, relatively uh, uh, simpler and you have primary and secondary protrusion. I was not aware it's a, it's only a, a primary uh, uh, lecture. I brought in both cases, but I don't think any harm is done. We can discuss those cases uh, any which way. Absolutely. Yeah. So we must define protrusion, its severity and problems. We must look at techniques of reconstruction and illustrative cases. So this is the brief of this particular uh, lecture. So, uh, it was uh, described as a medial and superior expansion of acetabulum. So, the superior expansion is often underrated and it's not uh, recognized by uh, especially the younger surgeons. So, in addition to a cavitary deficiency, there is also potential for superior segmental deficiency in some of these higher grades of protrusion. So, you must be uh, prepared uh, uh, beforehand. It was first described by Otto as a stress fracture of the medial wall with intrapelvic migration of the femur and was deemed to be progressive. And you have different types of uh, protrusion. The primary protrusion is uncommon. 
Uh, it is usually bilateral, familial, in uh, more common in females and progressive. While the secondary protrusion is as a result of rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile uh, ankylosing spondylitis, could be related to metabolic bone disease and Paget's disease. It could be a post-traumatic uh, thing like post-acetabular fracture or something like that, a post-infective or a post-operative type of uh, protrusion. Now, uh, most of these cases have got pain, limited movements, and uh, the uh, limb rotations are extremely painful and not possible in most of the situations. Radiologically, there is an altered relationship of the uh, acetabulum with respect to the collar slime. So, there is a medial migration of the femoral head with respect to the collar slime. And contrary to the uh, dysplasia, there is an increase in the center red angle of Weberg. So, it is more of a containment type of uh, uh, thing where you must look at it like a pincer type of astablum where astablum is overgrown and the femoral head is gone more medially. So that's what it looks like. The center of edge of angle is more than 20 degrees than the normal side. And these are the grades of protrusion and uh, between uh, 3 and 13 millimeters, you grade them into grade 1, grade 2 and grade 3 in men. And between 6 and 17 millimeter, you grade them into 1, 2 and 3 in women. So, this is all uh, theoretical stuff. And as per uh, AOS classification, they'll either be classified as cavitary or combined. So, you can have cavitary if there is a pure medial protrusion, but there will be combined deficiency if there is a medial and superior pro uh, protrusion. And you must look at how far the head has gone medially as compared to the ileoischial line, how much it has gone upward and how much is the head collapse. So, these are the three points which we look at. The primary protrusion, as I told you, is uncommon, more common in females than men. And it is, protrusion is most commonly seen in rheumatoid arthritis. And these are the two patterns of uh, protrusion which you must recognize. So, it's called as convergent protrusion, where the walls are converging with each other. So, this is a pure medial defect. So, there uh, the defect is more medial. There is no column loss in these cases. And the surgical strategy here is exposure will be difficult because the hip is externally rotated. The distance between the greater trochanter and the ischium will be very, very narrow. So, the sciatic nerve comes close to the hip joint in these particular cases and there is no provision for you to forcibly internally or externally rotate the hip to uh, make uh, uh, adjustments to the nerve and the trochanter distance. So, you must be aware of this particular point and we must clo stay close to the GT and stay close to the posterior border of the abductor and remove the peripheral osteophytes on the astablum. So, usually the astablum is overgrown. So, you can make uh, multiple cuts in the astablum on the posterior superior side. About a millimeter or two of astablar wall you remove. And sometimes you dissect anterior to the abductor like the two, up, two incision approach by Dr. Bosale and remove the anterior part of the astablum as well, a two millimeter. Then you can see nicely the uh, femoral head. You put two spikes around the inferior neck and the superior neck and do an in situ osteotomy for these cases. You don't try and dislocate the severe grades of protrusion. Minor grades, they will dislocate. But severe grades, look at the amount of osteoporosis, it will break. So you try and slowly uh, remove it piecemeal. The head is removed piecemeal. Then most of our options are uncemented options. We will not try and use a cemented option in this case. Again, based out of evidence, long-term outcomes except from the exeter group, have shown that cemented cups have got higher failure rates in the midterm in protrusio estabili. So, the current concept is to use a highly porous acetabular socket, which is uncemented, which is fixed with multiple screws and which has got a rim fixation. So, this, screw, this cup has got only rim fixation and we will graft the medial wall with bone grafts to reconstitute the bone stock. The second variety is what we call as a divergent protrusio. So, these are the cases which we must be wary of where the acetabular walls are not converging, but they are now diverging. So, you can see here, it's a divergent protrusio. In addition to a medial migration, there is a superior migration of the hip. And these are cases where there is a combined cavitary as well as segmental deficiency, which may need to be addressed. So, you will have to use some sort of a uh, augment or maybe a structural graft superiorly to reconstitute this in addition to the morselized graft medially. Or you can use an anti protrusion device with a cemented cup. More often in nowadays, we'd use a dual mobility cemented cup in these situations. So, this example addressed with a highly porous hemispherical socket fixed with multiple screws with uh, uh, medial bone grafting. One point here we must not 
over zealously lateralize the cup because if you notice here the neck shaft angle is in varus and the uh, distance between the tip of the trochanter and femoral head is again negative so the center of the femoral head is lower so you will have to have implants which have option where you can craniocaudally adjust the length so cemented stem is a good option in these situations because most of these patients are rheumatoid most of them have got severe osteoporosis and you can adjust the craniocaudal dimension of the uh, hip in using a cemented implant in these cases where it is ideally suited or you can yeah, use implants which have got a shorter neck length and offset so you must specifically know suppose you are using something like a corai hip you must use the collared uh, short neck variety which is available now instead of using the standard variety or you can use an extended offset variety in some of the cases where the neck length is more so those sort of adjustments you will have to do and plan accordingly now you again have post traumatic protrusio uh, due to acetabular fractures and sometimes because of tumors or hydrated disease also you can have this was a case of hydrated disease uh, which had significant protrusio with loss of uh, acetabulum now secondary protrusio is secondary to central fracture dislocation migrated endoprosthesis or failed thr with medial migration of the acetabulum and this typically or what we call as either a 2c defect on peprosky or a 3b defect so how do you know that the cup migration is medial to the iliopectineal line the hip center migration you must see if it is more than 3 cm above the level of the tear drop or more than 2 cm higher than the opposite hip center then that is considered higher grades of dysplasia like a grade 3 and if it is less than 3 cm it's a grade 2 c defect so typically this is a grade uh, 3 b defect with or without pelvic discontinuity so these are high grades defects which are seen in uh, uh, some of these secondary situations no uh, what is the approach to intra pelvic migration of cups you can do a standard posture approach with a trans femoral approach whenever the ct angio has shown that the vessels are not close to the migrated cup if the vessels are very close to the migrated cup sometimes you will have to use a subperitoneal modified stopas or iliopectoral and pararectal approach to retrieve the cup safely and then do the surgery from the back to uh, do it the primary objectives in these situations are to strengthen the medial wall and stop progression of protrusio you judiciously lateralize the acetabular component till the iliopectineal line you will not go over zealously lateral then you will not be able to reduce the hip you will have trochanteric convulsion and pain you try and normalize the center of hip rotation you have a rim fitting highly porous acetabular socket and you always reconstruct the defect using bone graft and use multiple screw fixation a cemented stem where you have a craniocaudal caudal adjustment possible that is a good option for these cases so as i told you before sciatic nerve is closer to the joint sometimes you may have to do a trochanteric osteotomy circumferential capsule release and osteophytectomy before you try and do the in situ osteotomy is the uh, uh, way to go so you may have to do a dual, dual approach to expose the acetabulum all around cut off 2 mm of the wall of the acetabulum to expose the femoral head and neck make an in situ neck osteotomy and then uh, uh, expose the acetabulum further and do your surgery so cement augmentation not a great idea uh, a cemented socket with uh, allograft or autograft is again not borne out in the long term so these uh, these are not options so we will do uh, uh, our option is a cementless socket wherever there is a convergent protrusio if there is a divergent protrusio you will have to use an augment with a cementless cup or a anti protrusio ring with a cemented socket which is cemented into it always bone graft the medial wall to reconstitute the uh, bone stock and judiciously restore the hip center of rotation if the translation of center of rotation is less than 2 cm that is a very low grade protrusio and you've got a very nice rim fixation you may not need to Uh, bone grafted but most of the situations you will have to put in the uh, medial graft so again uh, uh, management cement alone is not recommended as i told you so current standard of care is using a uh, either a uh, highly porous peripheral fitting uh, cementless socket with multiple screws or a reinforcement ring on a bone graft with cemented dual mobility socket so case example grade 2 protrusio You can see we medially bone grafted, judicially lateralized, used a cemented stem, where you can craniocaudally adjust the uh, length and offset for that particular patient. Another post-traumatic case, 
you can see it's a, a divergent protrusion it's gone up and out uh, uh then we have lateralized it with bone graft and then use a rim fitting uh, hemispherical socket with multiple screw fixation difficult situations again uh, this particular case was done long time back it's not recommended so we used a, a, a plate as a sort of a cage in this particular case but it's not recommended uh, so we got away with this at that point in time using morselized bone graft this cage as bone graft and uh, multiple plates for the pelvic discontinuity and a cemented cup but ideally you must use an anti protrusion ring uh, in all these cases now you can have a uh, uh, uh post operative uh, type of protrusio again the principles are similar this was an infection which was not recognized somebody did a bipolar and the lesion progressed and got infected and we did a two stage procedure where we uh, put in a spacer first and then did a revision hip again the same principles and this is a follow up showing good incorporation of the bone graft and reconstitution of the medial wall again example of divergent protrusion so you have that there is a superior and medial migration of the uh, hip and these again must be brought back to the native hip center so here you can do a partially elevated hip center where you have full contact but you must always graft the medial wall in order to get away more complex cases require greater planning and you need to do a ct angio in some of these cases and these require anti protrusion devices and a cemented dual mobility in my hands nowadays we don't use a standard cemented cup to avoid dislocation some of these cases will have uh, problems with bowel as well as uh, vascular uh, issues so this particular case was very close to the uh, uh, to the uh, vessel so we went from the front we found that it was all around the bowel and this is a uh, after retrieval from the modified stopas approach we found the intestine inside the acetabulum there and we had to push it back put in a mesh collar general surgeon in and uh, used a rim fitting uh, cup with this peripheral screw fixation again uh, potential for vascular injury in some of these complex cases so you must do a, a proper pre operative planning is an anterior approach where we uh, open from the front ilio inguinal approach you can see the cup in close proximity to the external iliac vein and if we try to retrieve it from the back you would cause uh, torrential bleeding and once we did that from the front we went back and uh, put bone graft use a trabecular metal shell and cemented a liner in a face changing manner and that's the seven year follow up showing good incorporation of the bone graft and uh, stable fixation so dealing with protrusio it's a difficult problem uh, careful evaluation of the deformity and uh, the awareness that it is stiff the sciatic nerve is close to the uh, gt there is necessity of uh, proper mobilization pre operatively with circumferential capsulotomy and removal of the 1 or 2 mm rim of acetabulum in situ neck osteotomy extensive soft tissue releases of the proximal femur to mobilize the femur adequately judicious bone grafting of the medial wall with a rim fitting peripheral socket with multiple screw fixation use of a stem with cranio caudal offset adjustment option is uh, uh, is important to restore the anatomy uh, and hip center of rotation and bone stock so uh, that is about protrusio in secondary protrusio we must carefully plan if the uh, additional approaches are required to retrieve the implant safely and you need to plan the reconstruction using highly porous sockets and face changing liners in order to accommodate this complex problem thank you thank you so much sir it is this is quite concise precise um uh, so what is your 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 uh, thought on uh, these uh, gripsion coatings and tm metal or tmrs uh would they be a game changer of sorts especially when we are using the anti protrusion cage and cemented cups have they changed your practice uh definitely the uh, use of um, you know, highly porous sockets especially something like a tmrs or a readapt cup Uh, which is a stick tight coating if i am not wrong the thing uh, uh, these cases sometimes require what we call as inferior fixation so you will have to fix it fix the cup even into the superior pubic ramus and uh, uh, also the ischium sometimes in order to get uh, more stability because the host bone contact is typically lower uh, in some of the uh, complex situations especially the revision scenarios 
so this has led us to use less amount of uh, cages with cemented cups because we know that the cage has got a mid term failure related to fracture of the cage because of mechanical failure there is no biological uh, you know ingrowth of the cage so nowadays if we use a cage we use a hybrid technique we will always use a tantalum augment and unitize the augment to the cage so what we call as augment cage technique so some part of that cage will biologically ingrow and other part is fixed to the bone so it's a sort of a compromise but definitely as you said gription tantalum and the stick tight all these have been game changers in my practice so i rarely use uh, uh, anti protrusion cages or bush rider cages in even complex scenarios sir in in post operative situations what would be your mobilization protocols uh, especially when we are doing a subtrochanteric shortening uh, uh, one and the other pa- patients in, in which rheumatoid arthritis or in ankle and spondylitis where you, the bone quality as you think on table is co- not quite good what would be your mobilization protocols in these two uh, situations the first situation there will be toe touch weight bearing for 6 weeks and then partial weight bearing for another 6 weeks and once the osteotomy starts healing then 3 months later they are uh, mobilized full weight bearing so this is explained to the patient beforehand for uh, other patient room protrusio patients are also toe touch weight bearing so we don't mobilize the patient full weight bearing so they do all their exercises but uh, if we have bone grafted the acetabulum <clears throat> we will toe touch weight bear them for 6 weeks partial weight bear for 3 months <coughs> and only after that we do full weight bearing but rheumatoid and ankle spawn patients would expect to get primary stability on the table so the osteoporosis is only going to get worse if we immobilize them so uh, we would try and get primary stability try and use uh, uh, all the techniques available to get good fixation and stability on table and mobilize the patient as per standard protocols we would not uh, immobilize these patients further sir in your practice after a subtrochanteric shortening or in uh, in, in uh, you know crew type 3 or 4 uh, do you see post operative radi- radicular pain uh, in, in patients no pain Yeah, yeah, if you've not done inadequate short, if you've done inadequate shortening, sometimes the hip reduces very tightly, and if you palpate the nerve, it is like a guitar string; it is very tight. Mm-hmm. So those patients are the ones who will get uh, prolonged neuralgia and uh, palsy. I have not had uh, patients with sciatic nerve palsy or neuralgia in my pro uh, in uh, dysplastic hips, but in uh, old trauma, I had one case uh, where I had a post-operative uh, nerve palsy. common peroneal nerve palsy recovered after 6 months uh, but this was a tight reduction so we did a 3 cm shortening i thought i'll leave uh, it was old girdle stone the only case where i had sciatic nerve uh, common peroneal nerve palsy after uh, uh, dhr otherwise i have not seen any of this so for your uh, protrusio cases when uh, when you're going to graft the wall uh, medially have you ever needed to use a mesh first have you ever done cases where you put yeah. a mesh grafted how do you do it so uh, uh, you can take a, uh, a titanium mesh which is available uh, most of the companies striker has it i think titanium mesh so you just place it in you don't need to fix that mesh it's just a sort of a a, a restraint type of device generally more, what happens in chronic protrusions it's not a acute protrusion like a primary protrusion which or a rheumatoid patient who suddenly worsened where there is a pelvic discontinuity type of thing usually there is a thin medial wall or sometimes a thicker medial wall which has formed against which you can uh, impact the graft but if you didn't have it you can you know overlap it with a metal mesh and then against that mesh you can graft in the case which i showed where there was intestinal herniation we just used a proline mesh which we sutured in it into different places because there was bowel there and then we kept on uh, you know uh, mosselizing the graft inside till it would not go in so maybe it will push more medially inside sometimes in that patient we had put her nbm for about a week or so because she had uh, paralytic illness because of bowel handling uh, uh, but uh, you know uh, the containment as such is easily possible with any sort of mesh sir any cases when you start off with um, uh, you know anatomic uh, cup reaming in dysplastic hips and you need to you know upsize you don't get a good ap capture uh, you do a, 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 a cotyloplasty as well and still you don't get that capture and are those cases uh, that you see on table that you need to upsize go in further 
what would be your thought process what should we be done do, doing in that situation so if you are uh, thinking of upsizing dysplasia it's bad news so if you should not okay. upsize in uh, dysplasia you must identify what is the ap size of the trastabulum carefully and it will come with experience right initially uh, it is difficult you know all of us have gone through that uh, phase where you know we, we do the surgery then we keep on reaming and then we ream out the wall the and then, then uh, there is no bellard you have to use a cage in those situations the smallest available cage i am sure is much larger than any of this and it's a big problem so uh, what you must do is start very very carefully uh, measure the posterior wall thickness and you know you can uh, do a cm intraoperative so not very confident you can check and there is no uh, shame in that uh, all of us have done it i still do all my uh, i verify all my cases under cm so so that you know you don't have any surprises so that is a way you just start with the smallest streamer possible go uh, uh, till the pulvanar so you will usually be able to identify the pulvanar and the transverse acetabular ligament once you get that then you slowly enlarge it and typically in dysplasia as grade 1 it will not be larger than 44 Very and good. in 2 and 3 it will be between 40 and 44 so if you are having to if you are getting some sort of a catch with the reamer our tendency is you know subconsciously we want to put a larger diameter head we don't want to put a 22 head so as surgeons we tend to you know chalo ek aur size kar dete hain but what happens with that is that the uh, posterior wall will blow out and then now you don't have any fixation because anterior superiorly there is nothing and posterior superiorly or posterior inferiorly there is nothing and people just supplement and some cup and then that will pull out in the second or third post operative day so if you have a problem like that you should you know accept it stop the surgery bail out then call some senior and then you know do it at a later date so that is the best option because we do something it will not work true and all of us have faced that uh, issue where you know uh, you can't do it so then you'll have to uh, uh, understand alternative reconstructive strategies you'll have to probably use augments and then do something uh, you know with augments and then reconstruct there's no other way of doing true so the the problem is uh, if if people don't keep bantham cups on table uh this is usually the situation so you you try to go in further and you blow out your your colon yes, that is right. the commonest situation that happens so uh, uh, as a rule for dysplasia even if it is a grade 1 dysplasia it is a good idea to keep good. everything available especially in peripheral setups nowadays we cannot you know patient needs surgery to be done at different places they, for various reasons they cannot travel and go uh, you know only to one surgeon or two surgeons so most of us are operating in uh, uh, in our country in a little bit suboptimal situation because of finance and then the implants are not readily available and then they are not supplying uh, but i think we should not attempt those cases without having uh, adequate equipment very true sir and uh, you find while putting the the anti protrusive cage as well you find that the cup is not fitting very well it's too large because we have got limited sizes kept on table uh, any tips and tricks for that uh, how how do you fashion it so that it goes in because uh, it is a problem a hardware problem that we find on table so, uh, what we have done uh, at our places we have uh, gotten one of the companies to customize uh, uh, sockets with an operator hook so i don't use the bolschneider cage type of device anymore mm-hmm. in my practice so if i have discontinuity i will do distraction but i have customized a cup which will you know which is little bit low profile it's easy to insert and have an insertion handle for it it's mm-hmm. much more easier so it's i think in our country we can do that uh, sort of thing the bolschneider cage is too big it will typically blow out the ischium it will blow out everything so i have had a significant trouble trying to putting it to put it in so if it is too problematic sometimes i take a metal cutting instrument and cut off that inferior flange hmm. then you can you know uh, it yeah you can put it in wherever you want hmm. and you have these drill bits which are available with most of our uh, hardware shops for 50 70 rupees which are metal cutting it's a good idea to keep that metal cutting drill bit with you so you can drill holes wherever you want True. and as i told you we don't use cages unless we are using an augment so we currently use a hybrid type of fixation philosophy where we use what is called as augment cage it's uh, where augment will ingrow into the bone and augment is unitized to the uh, cup with cement 
okay okay so now you have a hybrid construct now the cage is no longer loaded the augment will be loaded and the bone will be loaded so okay. will not have hopefully will not have mid term failures as the things because i noticed that cup cage is a very difficult thing to do in our population because the minimum cup size is 60 so you will not get 60 size true 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 so even in men the uh, it's 52 most of the time so even if it is a jumbo cup it will be somewhere 60 62 so cup cage has no, i have never done cup cages in my practice so it's always either an augment cage or a t marshal with uh, cemented cup so in a few of your cases with supra and infratrochanteric shortening uh, 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 deformities you have not uh, done a trochanteric uh, advancement or a trochanteric osteotomy isn't a proximal femoral shortening uh, uh, an easier option when you do a trochanteric osteotomy yeah it is it is a it is a it is actually a correct thing to do uh, where you uh, do a trochanteric uh, slide up and then you know do a sequential femoral osteotomy and fix it up my own experience with uh, trochanteric osteotomy is very limited so i have not much experience with trochanteric osteotomy so what we do is we release the abductor from ilium in those situations mm. we release it from the ilium taking care that uh, we don't injure the superior gluteal nerve so you can feel see the superior gluteal neurovascular pedicle release the abductor from ilium so you get some length and then we uh, Uh, optimize the compromise by you know uh, not over lengthening that neck shaft angle to normal we will you know accept some sort of shortening there and some correction we achieve intra trochanteric right 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 sir any role of uh, uh, any kind of uh, stem cells or any kind of uh, the newer cleats on the block uh, dbm and other things that we use for the osteotomy i have not personally used any of this uh, i have i might have done more than 100 of uh, the subtrochanteric shortening both in dysplasia and uh, non dysplasia situations mm -hmm. so i have encountered only one case of uh, i think two cases of non union so generally if you do it well they unite it's an intraoperative technical error if you get a non union we make a mistake so we are all human we will make some assessment judgment mistakes so that is one step where you have to be extremely careful and you know spend a lot of time to get that thing right so if you do it well get good stability you will not have issues with subtrochanteric so i have not used dbm or stem cell or it we can probably move on to the cases yeah uh dr ankit Yeah. Can you share your screen? We'll start with the cases. Uh. Can you share your screen? Yeah. Am I visible? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Ankit. Yeah. So I would be presenting a fifty-eight years old female patient. was a ra patient and wheelchair bound she presented with pain in the right hip joint since a year on examination there was a 3 to 4 cm of limb line discrepancy and there was gross restriction of movement this was a x ray she was a known ra case and was on dmrds so we can first discuss what all problems we had i had in my mind when i was trying to uh, plan this case so there is little bit of proximal migration of the femur there is medial migration and also there is query a breach in the middle wall at one point in one of the mri which i don't have the picture right now there was a breach over here this point uh, where i thought the medial wall is thinned out the only good thing was it was a convergent type of uh, protuso so i did my planning i always plan the other side with a two ap side to know the exact offsets of the hip the horizontal offset the vertical offset i calculated uh, that the hip uh, cup would be approximately 48 cm a uh, 48 uh, mm cup and it put on placing the cup on the iliosacral line uh, there would be about 2 to 2.5 cm of medial uh, defect which i planned to uh, fill it with bone graft and 
I could see that there was a gross shortening of about three centimeters illogical. So the problems that I had while I was operating, first, as told by sir, the exposure part. Uh, I don't do a neck cut straight away in C2 neck cut. I always try to dislocate the hip even in this condition. I spent a, lot, a little bit about 40 minutes in completely exposing the hip joint, uh, taking care of the shatic nerve. The, uh, the ischial to greater trochanter, as we see, there's very uh, uh, small places there, like it is too close to the ilium. And so I tried to take uh, use of a hook to bring out the femur. I removed uh, completely the iliosaurus, the gluteus uh, maximus, everything, all the uh, soft tissue release. I even did the tent approach anteriorly to take out the acetabul, uh, the femoral head from the acetabul. But after trying about 30, 35 to 40 minutes, when I was not able to take it out, I did finally an in situ neck cut. Even after doing an in situ neck cut, I was not able to expose the acetabulum as the hip was too tight. So what I did, I released the anterior capsule from the femur. I released complete soft tissue from the anterior part of the, uh, the acetabulum. And I exposed, uh, I put up a mob, the surgical mob in uh, below the gluteus medius and tried to elevate the abductors also. Uh, finally, I could expose the 360 degree of the acetabulum. This was the acetabulum inside. I used the head as graft over the medial side. I took a primary fit of a cup. This was the primary stem. And this was my immediate post-op XA. The offsets were maintained. The limb length was uh, maintained. And uh, it was good stable joint inside a uh, post-surgery. After uh, two months, I started, I started weight bearing at two months. And this is after two months of uh, surgery and the recent walking video. The patient has just started weight bearing about a day or so. That is why there's a little bit of lurch and a limb present, but uh, I think it will go over a period of time. So, thank you. Any? Nice. So what is, what is your thought process? Now, if we get a good AP capture in a conversion protrusio, you get a good press fit. Uh, would weight bearing actually enable incorporation of the bone graft uh, uh, better rather than... By Wolf's law, if we see when we have a very good purchase, uh, we, I, one another case, I had immediately done a weight bearing. But when I read a literature and I read a little bit of more data because it was the RA patient, rheumatoid patient, already osteoporotic. So I was a little uh, spectacle to put weight bearing on immediately post-operative. So I thought of uh, keeping uh, toe touch weight bearing for six weeks to eight weeks. That is the reason I uh, decided to uh, go slow. Krishna sir, what is your opinion on, on the same? So what happens with uh, Protrusio is that you will get only stability in the rim of the acetabulum. There will be no stability mm -hmm. medially. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, grafted it with maybe a, a, a 9 to 10 millimeter graph, big, thick graphs, and it is very stable. You can wait there, probably. But the challenge here is if it just goes a little bit inside, the cup goes a millimeter or two inside, it will lose the AP capture. So, even I would agree with Ankita, he has done a fantastic job for a difficult case. Uh, the uh, I did not want to talk about trying to dislocate that hip because uh, people will say that, you know, the mentor told us that we should dislocate the hip and they will end up with so many femoral fractures. So for normal people, it is always a good idea to, you know, uh, if, you, if you're on a, unable to do it, do the um, osteotomy in situ so that you avoid complications. But the way Ankit described is right. You have to try and try your best to try and get it out because in the process, you do all the soft tissue releases and the, you know, all the... Uh, extra bone removal. So I think it's very well done. And I would also not wait with the patient for okay. six to eight weeks. So that is my standard practice. Also. Thank you. Nice. So, so very well done case, uh, Dr. Ankit. So any other questions? Yeah. If not, then we'll move on to the next presenter. Yeah, Dr. Tausif, uh, 
your your up am i audible yeah you know yeah 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 of course so mine is case uh is just on that so uh, here is a 47 year old gentleman who came to me with the left hip pain since last 4 months and on examination he had adduction deformity internal rotations were negligible external rotations to 20 degree trendle work positive antalgic gait while walking no fbd but tld of 4 cm so on history this gentleman had intertrochanteric fracture which was operated by dhs around 6 months back uh, around a year back and immediately after 6 months uh, the implant was removed by the primary surgeon so the first thought that my came to my mind why was the implant removed i mean the only thing that i can think of is probably an infection uh, that is the reason that he might have removed it or maybe a migration of the screw dhs screw into the joint that is what i can think of so uh, looking at the x rays obviously it means that you know it's an arthritic hip so first uh, i'll evaluate the x rays So X-ray showed me arthritis, subcondylar cyst, and acetabulum overriding greater trochanter and DHS screw tract. And if you closely look at the DHS screw tract, it tells us that indeed the screw had penetrated the posterior wall uh, of the uh, posterior subcondylar bone of the head of the femur. Probably that could have been the cause of arthritis, you know, and that is why this primary surgeon might have removed the screw. So my dilemma was, why was the implant removed at the first stage? Whether it was infection or it was Uh, arthritis due to screw joint penetration and uh, screw penetration into the joint secondly so i did first the blood investigations which were essentially normal wbc was normal esr was uh, 40 but you know insignificant to label that as a cause of infection and crp was 9 so i did plan a uh, one stage or a two st- uh, i did plan uh, i mean two stage thr for him so first i did mri just to confirm you know whether i'm dealing with an infection or not so mri uh, findings were not very significant of arthritis uh, of the infection they did not show pus it only showed exuberant synovial hypertrophy mild free fluid was present so again i was in dilemma whether i am dealing with an infection or a uh, arthritis due to screw penetration so uh, mri but you know they were in, as you can see they had mentioned only mild hip joint effusion with synovial thickening but they had written infective etiology so i planned for a debridement curettage and excision arthroplasty and sent the head and the synovium for culture to see if it is really an infected case i am dealing with an infection or i am dealing with a primary arthritis so once i went down i removed the head completely and it, as you can see here if you can see here this is the anterior part of the head superior posterior and the inferior if you can see here the screw was completely eccentric into the posterior quadrant and it has completely penetrated the subcondylar bone of the femur if you see here and probably that was a cause of his arthritis but still because of the so much of dense exuberant synovium i was not very sure and i didn't indeed you know postponed the thr and sent the whole thing for culture bacterial culture essentially so the reports came in 5 days time all was negative you know there was no organism seen in either aerobic or anaerobic culture uh, afb culture had, i had done but the reports were not available but since there was no infection and as you see the wbc counts were normal even previously so i decided to do a t- total hip replacement after uh, i did this after 12 days so patient was you know not, i actually wanted to wait more but patient was like you know if you have already admitted me please do go ahead as early as possible so i waited for 12 days as the wound improved i went down i did i uh, actually contemplated doing uncemented thr but uh, when i started to read i could if you could appreciate because the cyst that was present in the acetabulum that actually opened up and uh, so i could not get a press fit uh, with the uncemented cup and uh, eventually i had to you know cement the cup so in in fact this is the first time that i had to uh, deal with such a situation so i was not very sure first of all whether to cement uh, the liner the uh, polyethylene liner directly and you know put the head or to cement the cup and then do the case so i decided to cement the cup with the uh, and i had first assembled the liner with the cup on table and then you know i cemented the cup onto the uh, acetabulum and these are the uh, these are the x rays so there was slight uh, breach of the medial wall but it was very insignificant maybe you know i could just a little finger was you know i could just feel that part had become soft so this is the positive x ray uh, this is the x rays of the 
patient. Patient was absolutely all right for four months. Patient was absolutely all right for four months. Uh, he did have some difficult. I mean, the leg was in mild internal rotation. If you see the mild internal rotation compared to the non-operated hip, but uh, apart from that, he did not have any other complaints. He was all right for four months, and after four months of time, he started to have pain, which gradually increased over a period of one week, and suddenly he just couldn't walk. When he said that he cannot walk, the immediate thing that I thought of is probably I'm dealing with a infection or I'm dealing with a loosening. So this is his X-ray after uh, uh, after four months. So if you see here, I can I uh, try to compare with the immediate post-op and after four months, I could see that the cement mantle, uh, which was say in the I mean slightly more medially, uh, it had already gone onto the lateral side. The cup has already uh, become more horizontal compared to the previous thing. And I could appreciate there is a lysis in the area here. So it was a case of infection. So I decided, and I did immediately uh, did a test. So the counts were at 18,000, ESR was 88, uh, CRP was 76, you know. And uh, so we knew that, you know, I'm dealing with an infection and probably that has caused a loosening. So I did a USG guided, you know, aspiration just to see what is the organism and to see the culture reports so that I can use the same cement uh, I can use the same antibiotics to put into the cement spacer. So fortunately, the organism that came out out of USG guided aspiration was uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, sensitive to most of the antibiotics. If you see here, so this is what I did. I uh, put in a cement spacer. Um, it was a for I, I mean it was the head was I think 48 size. So because of that, I had to require three gram, uh, three packets of cement plus with vancomycin, five percent weight by weight, and uh, so, and I kept him on antibiotics, linozolid, for uh, six weeks. He is actually now, six, uh, I mean, around two months post-op. This is his current X-rays. CRP, I repeated every two weeks, and it has constantly shown a decreasing trend uh, from 76 CRP at the pre-op before surgery. The CRP has come down to four, ESR is 28, and this is his current X-rays. So, I wanted to know the house, the opinion of the house regarding how should I go further about this case. Certain, certain challenges that I see in this case is that middle wall of the acetabulum is actually breached during the debridement. So if a uh, protrusive situation is there, high riding, you know, the if I have, if you see that the acetabulum is right, right now, high riding, center of rotation management, how to ma manage that, you know, how to bring down the hip, uh, how to manage the LLD, and how to manage the horizontal offset, whether I have to go with a cemented cup or an uncemented cup would do and requirement of a cage and a cemented hip, whether that situation would be good. And I always have this doubt whenever I'm doing a difficult situation, how to close up rotator uh, rotators. I mean, I find it very difficult in a case like this to close the rotators and the capsule. Uh, how, what do, what does the house does about, you know, most of the cases of that you have seen, I uh, presume that it must be difficult to close the rotators so, and regarding the sciatic nerve. So most of the questions have actually been answered by your talk. But still, I would like to have your opinion regarding this. Dr. Krishnakaran, your uh, thoughts on managing this further? You can stop sharing your screen if at all. Yeah. The, uh, I see, uh, there are a few things which are uh, wrong with this uh, thing. You know, if we, if we have a suspicion of infection, we must not go before six to eight weeks and operate the patient again. So the 12, 15 days is a uh, mistake, you know, Tausif, uh, made. all of us have made that mistake because patient will come and pressurize us to do. I think we should learn to be very, uh, you know, polite but firm that this is not the way we will do it. We will do it at six weeks. Second is that if you don't have intraoperative fixation, I think Anup was asking me about this uh, blowout thing and all that. We should not cement a uh, uncemented cup into the thing or do just some cementing because that will fail. So irrespective of the infection, this cup would have failed. Uh, that cup is not meant to be cemented. And there is enough evidence again in literature about uh, cementing metal back cups. So if you, I'll just take you through a little bit of history. Uh, uh, Derek McMahon was the one who started resurfacing. So uh, he once asked... Uh, is this guy Michael Freeman? Michael Freeman was a great influencer in England. So uh, he asked him, Sir, uh, what should I do? My cups are failing. Those days there was no coating, so 1992, 93. So he said, uh, Just stick some uh, cement, son. That was what he said. 
so he started cementing all his uh, metal back sockets and did resurfacing and they were disastrous because almost 80% failure at uh, two years and then he uh, spoke to michael freeman again and he said uh, of the freeman samuel sending so he said no no i asked you to cement the femur who asked you to cement the stabler so the metal back cemented cups are pathetic for survival so we should not do that first first take away for all the people who are watching i am glad tausif has presented this is a very few people are very honest to present their uh, complications and that is where we learn the most so now you are having a type 3a defect tausif where the uh, astablum is deficient and the hip has gone up and out so for the other audience uh, if you draw the inter tear drop line and see that the hip center has migrated more than 3 cm upward but the collars line is intact it's the iliopectineal line is not violated that much so it's probably a 3a defect but if the collars line is migrated and it's gone more than 3 cm it's a 3b defect so this is a perfect case for using a tantalum augment superiorly uh, so it could be posterior superior or anterior superior i'm not sure which direction because you will need to look at the lateral views due to this and ct scan for that but sometimes you can use two augments as well you can use a posterior superior and an anterior superior augment and then now you have uh, 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 inferior astabulum so uh, where you have to achieve fixation so this is the case i am talking about where you will use a trabecular metal astabular revision shell it's a tmars and fix it inferiorly into the uh, superior pubic ramus and ischium so you will make uh, mark your position of the superior pubic ramus so there is a technique which you have described as to how to identify superior pubic ramus intraoperatively and the imaging technique for that and uh, intraoperative technique it will come out shortly the video on that uh, and then the ischium you have to put screws and you will have roughly around 30% of astablum to uh, to get fixation once you do that you have two augments on the top which you have unitized to the t marshall inferiorly which is fixed inferiorly into the superior pubic ramus and ischium now you cement a dual mobility liner into this because we don't know the status of Uh, abductors in this particular case because it is uh, a previously operated intertrochanteric fracture and then again it has been operated twice so we must expect that it will be unstable as well so we will cement a dual mobility liner into this and if the proximal femur is good enough you can do a conservative femoral revision with a long esrom or you can use a wagner type of uh, stem to bypass all those uh, screw holes and get away because esr and crp is uh, reasonably okay and it was a sensitive bug and you have treated the infection well hopefully it will not recur but post operatively i would in my practice leave an intraarticular catheter and give two weeks of intraarticular antibiotics instead of systemic antibiotics for this patient and monitor the patient closely and also inform them about a 5% chance of infection recurrence in the future so that's what i would do in my practice two augments T Marshall dual mobility socket, inferior fixation of the astablum, Wagner or an esrom based on how much bone is available. Uh, so one question, one question I have for you is that you know if you see here, uh, I was expecting an infection to start with, but when I went inside, I saw that it uh, the screw was actually inside the femoral head. So you know that made me uh, that biased me that it is probably not an infection, but it is probably because of a screw penetration and the reports. Uh, came out to be negative after five days. Uh, I mean, there was no infection as such. So, how much how much I should have waited? Is there any protocol uh, that you should wait for six weeks or you know you should, what what is the protocol? So, what was the ESR and CRP at that time? At that time, it was normal. I don't have uh, the so physical copy. So the the mistake was that to operate too soon on the patient because now he is in a catabolic phase, mm -hmm. so he is immune compromised. Technically speaking, so twelve days is not a good time to operate any time. So, if you've taken a decision to wait. you might as well wait 6 weeks because then the body would have recovered probably it's an intraoperative infection which happened at the time of the second surgery but that is uncommon usually there will be some sort of infection which is there which will get apparent once you have opened the hip and you know it it will flare up later on uh, so if you thought that it was not infected you should probably have gone ahead and done the surgery in that same sitting same sitting if you have chosen to wait then you should wait 6 weeks because now the patient is neither here nor there you take to the surgery at 12 days it's not great so you do an intraoperative frozen section your esr crp d dimer values are all normal intraoperatively there is no evidence of infection or anything you should go ahead and do the surgery so that was a you know this these sort of things happen with each one of us so 
so is you are not an exception maybe we are not coming out and presenting it in the open or something like that but these are important to talk about because in our country the situation is different because yes. of the patient the yes. financial yes. issue implication so many things are there so we all have fa- we all face that even now so it is not a uncommon thing but eventually what we believe and what we should do is what is in the best interest of the patient because it will all come back because the patient will still come back to you because he believed you and came you for the sur- first surgery if there is something which goes wrong he will come back again so if you face a situation in the future where you are not able to get some fixation on the acetabulum it's a good idea to just abandon the surgery don't do anything leave a girdle stone or put in a spacer and then go back talk to somebody plan the surgery properly call a person to proctor you assist you or help you call your friend if you don't want to call a senior guy then two brains will work better and then you can plan and execute it in a better way so uh, just one question you had said something about that intra articular antibiotics for two weeks could you please explain that yeah so we use a swan gun catheter intra articular so that's our standard practice for last 15 years so all one stage or primary uh, two stage revisions or everything we don't like to give systemic antibiotics because i have uh, some you know uh, uh, interest in uh, holistic health and what we do so microbiome is a very important part of uh, individual so if you put people on long term antibiotics it will destroy the natural bike microbiome so mm-hmm. microbiome determines what we are actually the most of our behavior patterns the neuro uh, tra- transmitters everything long term health is dependent on what sort of microbiome we have that is why the type of food we eat and everything is important because uh, uh, we have around 100 trillion bacteria inside of us and only 4 trillion cells so you kill uh, they are in lot of balance you know you kill these things with long standing systemic antibiotics mortality and of that patient will be very very high mortality and morbidity i think the mortality following infected joint replacement is under report that's what i feel worldwide and uh, uh, so we started this practice from leo white side so it's not a unknown technique but we use a uh, intra articular catheter to give all these higher antibiotics something like a colistin or you know this thing and if you really follow those patients for 6 uh, weeks 8 weeks on iv antibiotics which they talk about i think none of them will tolerate and uh, they will have so many other problems you know gastrointestinal problems inability to eat and we are treating the patient as a whole not just the leg so my belief is that if you give local concentration of antibiotic then you minimize the systemic toxicity and there is a research work which has come from leo white said group which has shown that the synovial concentration is way above the mic and it is maintained throughout the day instead of just at the time of the antibiotic infusion uh, if you give systemic antibiotic only 3 4 hours the antibiotic will be there but if you inject into the joint 24 hours there will be uh, antibiotic in the joint and it will inhibit cfus in the joint without so that, having... that catheter when you are injecting you are not uh, trying to introduce you may introduce infection more to the joint the one gram catheter is left inside the pulmonary artery so it has got so many bacterial filters you know so it is our standard practice to use epidural catheters for pain management and all this because they are all full proof you you put it inside the pulmonary artery i don't think any thing else is in, do you inject uh, do you cause infection with uh, your uh, swan gun catheter and pulmonary catheter at which pressure monitoring and all that i don't think so the central venous lines they are of course they are there is a potential chance but you have to be careful how you give the antibiotics ideally you should give it for 6 weeks but it's not possible in our setup so we give it for 2 weeks and then we take it out at 2 weeks and found a reasonable uh, compromise in my practice so i have around 82% success rate with my infections around 18% of patients still recur and they are really tough to handle you know the, they come with lot of faith and belief and um, uh, it's very very difficult to handle these patients so that uh, endoclinic as well they use these metal bag cemented dual mobility mm-hmm. cups quite often especially in infected mm-hmm. ones what is your take on that uh, yeah so uh, the long term results of these are not you know proven so you can use them in conjunction with a cage uh, you cannot them use them as a stand alone devices because then at 4 5 years these cups will loosen that has been shown time and again the metal back cups don't get cemented well and especially if you have a large diameter head like a dual mobility if your life expectancy is less or if you are dealing with an elderly patient that is fine then so a 80 year old patient or a 75 year old patient with a 5 7 year life expectancy it's fine but if it is a patient who has got a longevity more than 10 years you expect 
it's not a great idea i would not do it in that way. so i would put in a cage if you want they have a karbul type of cage in their uh, armamentarium the evolutis guys so you can put the karbul cage and then cement it into that then it may last longer right right okay nice case dr chintan uh, we move on to the next case is dr chintan around yeah yeah share your screen share my screen <clears throat> Okay, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, I'm. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Chintan Jadia. I am a lecturer in Sion Hospital. I'm going to be presenting a case of total hip arthroplasty in a protrusive hip. Uh, so, this uh, patient is a 38-year-old gentleman barber by profession. Uh, came with acute and chronic left hip pain. Uh, the injury sort of the pain started after the patient missed a step while walking. came to us with a very severe uh, left hip pain and he had around 2.5 cm of shortening uh so significant history the patient had a pelvic and old rather pelvic and left hip injury 17 years old uh, 17 years back when he was run over by a truck he was operated for bladder rupture then but the pelvic and hip injuries were conserved since then the patient had uh, some amount of pain and limp in the left hip which had been progressive but there was no any no evidence of infections or discharge around the hip he did not have any symptoms pertaining to uh, rheumatological uh, illness or any tuberculosis or uh, cox contact so when the patient presented to us the laboratory investigations did uh, show significantly elevated inflammatory markers but uh, the cbc and all the other tests were unremarkable so this is the x ray at presentation in the ap and the lateral view <clears throat> so we see the patient has a great troop uh, two protrusio there is probably a subchondral fracture because of which the patient presented with acute pain the old malunited pelvic injury is seen there is some varus remodeling of the neck and a hypoplastic femur uh just to rule out uh, any deformity further down in the femur i did uh, take uh, full length femur ap and lateral views uh because the, the when the patient was admitted he did spike uh, fever twice so i went it did a synovial tapping found the synovial fluid wbc count was low neutrophils were only 61% but i was still scared for infection that is why because of the raised inflammatory markers and the fever spike i deferred the surgery by 6 weeks at 6 weeks the CR, uh, crp values dropped down to 2.1 esr was still a little high at 41 but then we decided to go ahead with surgery standard posterior approach was taken uh for releasing uh, for the acetabular exposure i uh, released the short external rotators and the capsule capsulotomy done from posterior the head was easily dislocated uh and a provisional neck cut was taken after the head was dislocated out uh acetabular preparation was done using uh uh just scoring the cartilage with the cautery and just brush rimming the acetabulum till raw i did take a morselized graft from the uh, head and also added allograft to it to lateralize the acetabulum and impacted it with a, a liner impactor a uh, ha coated cup 48 mm uh, was used uh, i got a good rim fit and secured it further with three screws uh, a high cro highly cross linked polyethylene liner uh, with a long posterior wall was used uh, which was dialed posteriorly and superiorly because the femur was already hypoplastic i started with a, a, a smallest a size available size 0 rasp and only uh, and that itself got a press fit in the femoral canal uh, for getting the hip down i had to release the glute uh, the tendinous insertion of the gluteus maximus and pie crusted the iliotibial band with this i could get a reduction with the standard trial head um, i use a fully ha coated stem and a 32 mm ceramic head and uh, this was the final post op x ray uh, just the comparative image of the pre op and the post op x ray 
the patient did not have any limb length discrepancy after surgery a uh, patient was made to uh, walk with uh, uh, with a walker support uh, from day one of surgery patient was comfortable and this is the three month follow up x ray of the patient in ap and the lateral views thank you Yeah, you can stop sharing, Doctor Chintan. Yeah, yeah, you have done it. So, so what is your your opinion on the case? Um, uh, I think it's a well done uh, case. I think the patient had some intercurrent illness because of which ESR and CRP were probably elevated. <clears throat> One point about uh, this particular stem when they are using it, uh, the distal canal needs to be reamed, and you know it must. Uh, Make sure it doesn't fix distally before it fixes proximally. So they are fully HA coated stem. It's a proximally fixing device still. So a lot of the times you will get pseudo stability, especially in uh, door type A canals, where you know the rear stable distally. So you will know this when you are introducing the stem itself. In, in, instead of the entire stem going in up till two three centimeters uh, of its tip, the once you introduce it itself, you will get some stability there. And if you accept that size, it will get uh, failure in the midterm because that is distal fixation. So what you must do in such situations is ream this particular uh, canal, Dore canal, ream them to at least 10 millimeter. Uh, or if you're using 11 stem, use 11 uh, millimeter reamer. Ensure that there is no distal cortical contact and the stability is proximal. So that's the only point. And it's not a great device to use in protrusion situations because, you know, the neck length and offset are, uh, it's called as homo, stems where you know the neck length remains constant and the offset is almost 37.5 which is too high so although they now have the collared variety which is you know short neck length which has got a 33 offset that is what we must keep in uh, standby for female patients and uh, for people who are you know uh, tight situations like protrusia because if you have a fixed offset uh, type of situation or an increasing offset then the reduction becomes a problem and you'll have to do too much soft tissue release and try and push it in. And sometimes the trochanter avulses and then there are issues. Otherwise, the case has been extremely well done. So I think uh, no comments. Demented stems and this is what uh, you would prefer to have? As a bill, I would and... not mind a cemented stem, but this was a 30-something patient. So I would, you know, uh, I, although the registry data says that a colorless polish taper is equally good as compared to thing it is all subject to you know uh, what we call the surgical technique so core stem is probably good for that fellow because the uh, stem has got what we call as radiological silence so even at 30 years if you do 100 coral stems all of them will be silent so there will not be uh, that's what we want you cannot say that one core one chanli stem has lasted 30 years so the other stems are waste so that is how the typical uh, you know we have conversations in some of the meetings that is not right each patient who gets the device must be radiologically silent for a long period of time. That is when it is successful. So you have devices like Corey, you have devices like Bicontact. These have all been worn out for 30 years, 99.8% with respect to aseptic loosening. So those are that is what we must aspire for in young patients. And uh, cemented stem definitely causes some sort of a mismatch between the proximal and distal part of the femur. And you know, there is higher risk of peripheral fracture later on. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a good idea. On growth stems, fully coated, uh, HA coated, or you know, or proximally fixing devices, uh, which have got radiological silence, must be chosen for the patient. Should not do a porous coated stem, for example, or a summit type of stem or synergy, where it is digitally fixing in the young patient. So now you have burnt the. Uh, it will last 20 years, but later on you will see after 20 years you will do an AML or a synergy or summit. It will you know resolve all the bone in the proximal flow mm -hmm. and it's a nightmare for revision. The cup will come for revision any which way. You must do a stem which is easy to revise, re retains bone quality, has radiological silence, and promotes bone remodeling primary. So message for all the young surgeons. True. Well done, case. Well done, case, Dr. Chintan. Thank Dr. You. Sahil. Uh, you're up next for the last case of the day. Sorry, just one, one second. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Click on the button twice. Yeah. Mm. Or oh, maybe can can you take uh, access of my? I'm not able to share it for some reason. Uh, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, just share screen, then a window will open. Then just no. go your desktop. Your desktop. I mean, click there. Mm. Just, sorry, just give me a minute. Yeah, yeah, sure. Vivan, Rupal Masi. Maybe you can email it to one of us. Yeah, I think we can do that. Um, Sorry, just give me one last minute. One. Yeah, minute. sure, sure, sure. No problem. So the other day we were having a a, a word with uh, uh, Dr. Surya Narayan. Uh, he was of the opinion that now uh, we were into the era of TMARS and uh, Tantalum and. I think uh, for his personal opinion, he said that we try, we, we should try and conserve bone. So then uh, he's back to using, you know, the flying buttress graft and bone grafting a lot. Uh, so where do you see that go going as far as your practice goes? Using bone graft, essentially bone and impaction bone grafting. Yeah, in, impaction bone grafting, big yes, but. Uh, uh, I think uh, figure of seven, all these drops have, you know, shown to uh, resolve in the midterm. The, there's enough evidence that uh, the failure is as high as 40% at 10 years. So I don't think we should revisit the whole thing. We do the same mistakes, we will get the same outcomes. So what I would do is I would not hesitate to uh, morselize bone graft the uh, stablum at all. I would try and do it. But I will not use bulk allografts for my revision patients. I will not use them. So I will always use an augment and something like that. It's a much more predictable and reliable uh, method of... Yeah. And your take on cup cage constructs as regards uh, cage and cemented liners? It doesn't make any sense to me because, you know, uh, most of our patients do not have 60, 62 sockets. And the smallest cage which you can fit in is 44, which has to be fitted on the 62 cup. So, you will not be able to uh, uh, use them in majority of the situation. So, it is not of much use and some of the things which are promoted as cup cages are not cup cages because something like the MRS Titan from uh, the link or something like that, it is not a cup cage. It is, it is just a cup which has got options of screw fixation into the pelvis. So, it is not a, a foolproof method to say that it lean grow. So, uh, I would still look at... Uh, Augment with TMARS or either use an augment with the cage. I will not, you know, do a cup cage. The augment cage does the trick because it's cheaper and it will give you all advantages of a cup cage without having to put in a 62 something. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sahil is trying okay. to send it on email. Okay. Waiting. Yeah. Any questions? Any other questions from the audience? Or something like that?
Yeah, sir. Uh, in in situations wherein we are suspecting infections, uh, possibly hips or knees, uh, you see a post-operative situation, especially in the first one month when ESR CRP is borderline. Uh, ESR is around forty-five, fifty. Uh, the joint is silent, no pain as such. Patient just has some some kind of uh, weak weak pain, especially for the knees. Patient has some pain in the first one month, but ESR and CRP is high. Uh, counts are pretty normal. There is no effusion, no tappable fluid. This is about the. Uh, are we talking about the operated patient? Yes, sir. Post operatively. Post operatively, yeah. It's a difficult, uh, you know, uh, thing to diagnose a post operative infection. Uh, so I think the recent there are some uh, additional criteria for acute post operative uh, infection. So uh, some. I am not exactly sure what the criteria was. Recently, it was introduced by the uh, Musculoskeletal Research Society. The recent anybody knows that uh, what is for acute PGI. But uh, you're right. The ESR CRP is expected to be high in the first month, and uh, if the joint is silent, I think we should wait and watch and see what's happening. So I think if I if I remember correctly, they said that after the first week of the surgery. If the CRP is hundred or more, yeah, something like that. Then that can be considered to be infective, especially yeah. if it fits in with the uh, signs of the patient clinically. ESR is not something that they would uh, look at in the first uh, few weeks because that is bound to remain high for long. Yes. The CRP that, normally comes down at four, after four to seven days. That is what four to seven days, which is what they say. If it's, but if it's around eighty, ninety, hundred. And patients got a lot of pain, and you know the wound is oozy. Yeah, like so that. if you have persistent serious discharge for more than five days, that is a sign of infection. Any which way, we'll have to open that and wash it out. But uh, uh, if the joint is otherwise silent, pain is expected after surgery, right? So for if it is worsening pain or you know constant pain, night pain or something like that, then maybe we have to be more aggressive. Maybe look at D dimer as a marker. The D dimer tends to be elevated in the infection as well. It's non-specific, but in the presence of elevated CRP and ESR, it is uh, it becomes more. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have the case, Sahil. Uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, extremely sorry for the delay. So good evening. Uh, I'll be presenting a case of protrusion. and continuing with the previous theme of the convergent types i'll be presenting a divergent type of protrusion so this was a 33 year old gentleman he had a history of having some right hip infection in childhood the details of which were not too clear but there was a previous scar of surgery which was present and he gave a history that some as per his parents he was told that some clean up and material was sent for testing so most likely a debridement and a biopsy was done at that time which was about 22 years ago so most likely suspicion was that it might have been a tubercular arthritis to start with and this is a post tb sequelae so usual protrusion that we see is of the um, convergent type where the hemispherical cavity is seen with a wide mouth and the rim and the depth are almost of the same width but if we go to the next type which is the current case this is like a convergent type or oh, sorry this is a divergent type where the mouth is extremely narrow but once you go inside the acetabulum at the mid, um, middle one third level of the acetabulum you suddenly find that it's pretty wide so this is the divergent type of protrusion and this is similar to a bottleneck shape or an omega shaped acetabulum where inside the acetabulum is extremely roomy but the mouth of the acetabulum is quite narrow and this case also had some superior migration if you compare it to the opposite side there was some superior migration as well so this was a superior migration plus divergent protrusion type and the other question was whether to go in for a high hip center or try to restore the original native center of rotation there we could have reamed till the base but if you see as per the uh, native center of rotation there would be a superior void in the acetabulum and grafting that large of an area would not be a good idea which would also be have a anticipated a difficult reduction here and releases would be needed and we planned for a stem which had a minus option as well so many companies don't have the minus head options available so we chose 
went in for an implant system that allowed a minus head option with a short offset. Because if we over lengthen or if it's a difficult reduction, then there is a risk of trochanteric avulsion in these cases because it was quite an old stiff hip. So here the main uh, difficulty that I faced was that while reaming, the mouth was extremely narrow. So initially the reamer would um, have a tight fit, but the minute it would go in, it would lose its hold. And here this is also demonstrated with the trial uh, cup that I had uh, with the trial in place where I'd taken a Siam shoot. The, there was a thin rim which would hold the cup. That time you would have a slightly good hold and you would feel you're getting a good capture of the anterior posterior walls. But the minute you would hammer it slightly more, it would suddenly give way, go inside. And once it would go inside, it would be extremely wide and capacious inside the acetabulum. So, which is why here I decided to go in for a high hip center and I nibbled out the superior rim, which was making the mouth narrow. So the superior and acid, uh, the superlateral rim, about five millimeters of that part, I eventually nibbled out and I went in for a high hip center with some mosselized bone graft behind the cup. And this was the post-op X-ray. I had to accept the slight limb length discrepancy here, but I was able to get a good hold with a high hip center. And the, for the reduction, it was difficult because I had to release along the gluteus maximus, the linea aspera, the iliopsoas, and circumferential release of the capsule as well. But eventually, the patient did not had good range of motion and did not have any sciatic nerve stretch. Thank you. So what do you do? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. So I think it's the uh, points which have been well illustrated by Sahil. Uh, he has shown us the problems with protrusion. And that is the reason why we should always fix it with screws and always, you know, uh, delayed weight bear and graft the medial side. But otherwise, the... Once it goes in, it becomes loose. So the fixation is rim fitting. And there is a problem with divergent protrusion. The only way he could have gotten away with anatomic hip center here was if he used a superior augment and then you know, brought the hip center down. Uh, that's the only way. Uh, but otherwise, I think a slight elevated hip center in this case is, uh, is an acceptable option. Again, uh, Coral not a great choice for uh, stem in these particular uh, cases because, you know, that fixed offset. Uh, situation but uh, i'm glad he got away with that uh, particular case and uh, sizing of the corral and everything looks good and these patients have been tight for years and we're not trying to restore their leg length and you should tell them that we'll get them around a centimeter or two of length but we'll not be able to get full length uh, a full lengthening uh, in these situations and they need to use the shoe rail plate so that's okay i think it's all in all a good uh, case nicely done so you would prefer a TM augment uh, or, or a high size cage, uh, uh, high size cup, as Sahil has done? Uh, Sahil has used a higher hip center. Yes. So uh, that is perfectly okay for me. So I would not uh, you know, increase the cost of the operation by putting an augment for a centimeter of high hip center. So this is absolutely okay for me. So I would, I would so have done you, the same thing. If you have a high hip center and you need to uh, normalize the limb length, what would be your options? Now you've accepted a high hip uh, you cup. can use a uh, higher neck cut and you know this anyhow it was useful for him because the tight protrusion reduction was yeah reduction was anyhow tight so he uh, protrusion is usually a varus neck where there is a low offset and a, a large horizontal but a low vertical offset so you take a low neck cut on this and use a stem with a extended offset but low neck length option so that is the thing you have to do so you have an extended neck length option available with uh, Corel. I'm not sure it's available in India. And they also have a short neck length option. So the neck shaft angle, you have to adjust to whatever is the native anatomy. So um, in this case, I think it worked out for him because he now had no issues with reduction of this. Uh, if he had brought it down, put in an augment, it would have been more complex unnecessarily. And then the reduction would have been even more difficult. So in these particular situations, partial release, pie crusting of the gluteus medius uh, uh, slide, what would be your choice when we are just finding it a little bit too tight uh, for comfort, but we are committed to the stem? Generally, uh, I would have low threshold to convert it into a cemented stem because then, you know, you can sink it a little bit more inside. Once I'm sure that 
I've done my Gmax release, I've done the anti capsule release, and then I've done my uh, adductor tenotomy, whatever is the, the thing. And I would probably release the abductor from the ileum, not you know, do an abductor slide from the insertion because I would have worry about rupture of the abductor. So I would release it from the ileum, and once I'm sure that I've done everything uh, possible, and still it is very tight, then I will reduce the uh, offset further by using a cement stone. Sure, sir. So we, we call it a day. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was it is really to the point, succinct, uh, with a lot many learning points, and you were just too crisp and accurate about your your learning points. Thank you for that. Thank you for calling me. I hope it was useful. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the speakers thank as well. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers. They've done fantastic uh, job. I think keep it up and uh, keep doing good. Work. Great case. A great forum, you know, to get the young surgeons together and uh, kudos to Jay and uh, our friend here. So I think both of you are doing fantastic job. Nobody looks at the young surgeons uh, with so much care. Uh, I think they are the future for this country and eventually more they learn and uh, more patients will get touched by their uh, expertise that will be good for the country. Thank you, sir. Great industry. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you so sir. much, speakers. And we call it a day. Thank you for your participation. Have a good night. Bye, Jay. Bye, Anup. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye, bye. Good night. Good night. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So, thank you. Dr. Sahil, it worked. Sorry. Actually, actually, I didn't have my laptop with me. I was no, using no someone else's laptop. So. Thankfully, it worked. Yes. So, thank nice you. Case. Dr. Tawasif, thank you. So thank you. Good night. We take. We 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 shall see you in person. See you. Bye bye bye. Thank you. Bye.